Bahamas, and welcome to The Hit Back. I'm your host, Nahaja Black. It is a beautiful day here in the 242. I hope that everyone is doing well, that we're taking care of ourselves, and that we are embracing this time as, uh, you know, folks who are able to conquer special, um, a special beginning to this show for you. Yesterday, we had on the show, um, with us was none other than the uh, dame herself, Dame Joan Sawyer, who was with us um, on the show yesterday talking about constitutional matters. And it was a pleasure to have the dame talk about it. We've, of course, uh, a lot of the clips have gone viral since then. Um, I know that they'll be in certain news uh, papers and whatnot, but yesterday out of that conversation with uh, former Chief Justice, Supreme Court uh, Justice, Dame Jones uh, Sawyer, was the statement that was made that the Supreme Court is closed for business. And I got a wonderful call from our senior editor who told me that there was someone who would like to set the record straight. And the person who wished to second, set the record straight was none other than our very own Chief Justice himself, Chief Justice Brian Mori, and uh, I'm very happy that he's here with us. And so we're going to start off the show with the the accurate statements that need to be made um, post um, the show yesterday with Dame June Sawyer, in particular with regard to the closure of the Supreme Court. Chief Justice, how are you today? Thanks for being on the show. Uh, good afternoon, Mrs. Black. Thank you very much. Well, listen, I am so humbled. I'm excited that you called yesterday, that we spoke yesterday, and that uh, we were able to discuss um, a key part of what the dame said that was a bit inaccurate, and that's important that we note. And that is the fact that the Supreme Court is not shut down for business. And I think for many of us, that was a surprise. And as I said yesterday, when we spoke, that that was an error that I'm very embarrassed that I made not knowing that the Supreme Court was not closed for business. So please give us a bit of uh, information on how did we, how is it possible that we might have mistaken that, the layman, and someone as terrible, terrible as me, I should have known better, but how did, was it possible? And, and what is the status, the working status of the Supreme Court at this point? Well, yes, I, I just thought it was important for the benefit of the Bahamian people um, to, to clarify the position and to make sure that the correct information is available. Um, the initial proclamation of the emergency was made back on the 17th of March of this year. Um, and I, I can state quite categorically that the Supreme Court um, and the Magistrates Court uh, have never been closed across the board during this period of time. So that's really the first point. Um, I repeat for emphasis that, that the courts cannot simply close the door, lock it, and go home. Um, there are essential services that the court must continue to offer, even during a period of emergency. And we have a constitutional uh, function that we must perform, and we must continue to provide public access to justice. And that is what we have done throughout the, the period since the 17th of March up to the current date. Where the confusion may have occurred um, is that, that our courts, like courts throughout the region and indeed throughout the world, have had to curtail some of its operations and scale back some of its hearings during the pandemic period uh, because of the public health issues. And so we have gone through periods since the 17th of March up to the current date where certain activities are being curtailed, certain hearings have been suspended for periods of time. But I, I hasten to say that we have never stopped hearing essential court matters and we have never stopped providing public access to justice. Um, for example, the, uh, the registry in the Supreme Court, um, which is where all court documents must be filed, and that's really the gateway into the Supreme Court system, um, has never been closed. Now, let me clarify this because some people might, might get confused. There have been times when we did close um, the civil registry in its current location on George Street. Um, and we closed um, other registries. I'll, I'll detail them in a moment. But 
when we did close these registries, we opened a satellite registry in the annex, what we now call Annex 1, which is the Ansbacher building. And we have always kept open uh, at least one satellite registry in the Supreme Court building um, in Ansbacher 1 for the purposes of allowing parties to file claims and to file papers for urgent matters. So we have five registries in, in New Providence. We have a civil registry, we have a criminal registry, we have a family registry, we have a probate registry, and we have an appeals registry. Um, now, as I said, at the height of the, of the emergency back in late March and April, we, we closed the current locations of those registries, but as I said, we reopened a satellite registry in the Ansbacher building. Also, there is a, a, a cashier's counter um, in the Ansbacher building where, where litigants and lawyers have to physically file their documents. That cash counter has never been closed, never. Um, mm. It's continued to be open. We curtail the operating hours. So instead of operating from 9.30 to 4.30, we did scale it back at, at, at various times to a half a day, sometimes in the morning, sometimes in the afternoon. And of course, we have always informed the public of this by public notice, and we've been posting all of this material on our website. Um, so I, I think the confusion may have occurred where because we were scaling back certain operations, people may have gotten the impression that we weren't doing anything at all. And that is, that is, that is absolutely not correct. In the magistrate's court, we have continued to do arraignments, which are first pleas um, every day. We, we continue to deal with remands, these are persons who are in BDOCs, um, you know, in the Bahamas Department of, of Correctional Services um, that, that have to be brought before the court every seven days uh, if they're on remand. We have continued to do that every day. We have continued to, to hear um, urgent matters in the magistrate's court. Um, they had to be urgent, and so many matters were not heard. We suspended new trials, um, part heard trials, um, but but all of the essential services were kept open. Mm. Family court, it's important to make this point because a lot of Bahamians um, are involved with our family court, either making child support payments or maintenance payments or receiving these payments. Now, we've had some problems in that area, logistical problems, but, but that has never been shut down either. Um, persons may not have been able to get their money for various administrative reasons, which we are addressing, but we never closed that particular facility, and it's still open today. In the Supreme Court, we have continued to hear arraignments. Um, we've always heard urgent bail applications on the criminal side. Um, we have not been hearing criminal jury trials, and if you want to explore that shortly, we can do that. There, there are very good reasons for that. Um, and we have continued to hear uh, what's called case management hearings and status hearings. On the civil side, uh, we haven't been doing um, trials until uh, about a month or so ago, but we were always hearing interlocutory applications. These are urgent applications um, for injunctions, um, some, some domestic violence applications we have continued to hear. Um, and we have, we have migrated from in-person hearings, which is, was, was the norm up until COVID-19 in the usual, right. to remote hearings using the limited um, resources that we have. So we have, we have all the judges now on their laptops, on their iPads, um, conducting hearings. Um, our listing office um, is open and, and we're giving out dates. Um, and so I just wanted to clarify that matter. We can get specific in terms of what we're doing and what, uh, what we're not doing. Right. But I want to acknowledge the fact and I want to inform the behavior public um, that we take our responsibilities extremely seriously the judiciary is an independent co-equal branch of government. Um, that is a principle of high constitutional importance. It can never be compromised and we will never tolerate any incursions into that principle. Yet on the same, at the same time, during these unusual times, we have to balance the public health and safety and well-being of our judicial officers, of our staff, of members of the bar, and of course, of the public who use the court system against our need to continue to provide essential court services to discharge our constitutional duties. And that is what we have done, Mrs. Black. 
I'm so excited that you're here. We have Chief Justice Brian Murray here with us, joining us on the show, bringing some clarity. One of the things, uh, Chief Justice, that um, was shared, and I think a lot of us were surprised to learn this. Um, well, I was, I don't, maybe a lot of us weren't, but my ignorance might just be unique <laughs> in that um, the magistrate court cannot hear any constitutional or cannot determine if an offense is arrestable, not just constitutionally um, viable, but is an arrestable offense based on what was said. Is that something you can confirm with us? Is that accurate? Well, Mrs. Locke, I don't want to engage in that dialogue for, I hope, reasons that you understand. Understand, yes. Um, I mean, in, in my current position, I, I cannot express personal views on these matters. Right. Uh, all, all I can say is this, and I think this may be the important takeaway. If at any time during the emergency, going back to the 17th of March, the current day, or indeed, if at any time in the future, anyone wished to file a constitutional motion, the, 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 the important point I wish to make is that they could have done so. The mm. registry has always been open. We have always had judges hearing matters, um, particularly urgent matters, um, and so, if anyone wanted to file a constitutional motion in the Supreme Court, they could have done so. And indeed, they continue to do so. Now, once the matter is filed, of course, it doesn't get heard the next day. Um, there, are, there are procedures that have to be followed. We, we have heard many, many applications for injunctions during the emergency, um, which are by, by their very nature urgent. Um, most of these applications have been heard um, by remote platform but some of them have been, have been in-person hearings subject to the physical distancing requirements. So I don't want anyone to think um, that they, they couldn't file a constitutional right. because the courts were closed. I mean, that, that most respectfully to all concerned, that is not the case. Mm -hmm. And that's very important to note, right? It's very important to know that so that the argument is presented that we can still go ahead if there are any challenges with anything that is going on legally, the judicial system is still here working on behalf of the Bahamian citizenry. And I, I go ahead. No, no, I was just going to say absolutely. Now, I do want to make the point because I, I, I don't want to be called out for this. I, I, I want to emphasize that there's certain types of hearings during this period from March the 17th to the current day, which were not being pursued, you know, for obvious reasons. I mean, we could go into the details on that. So I don't want to suggest that the pandemic and the emergencies had no impact on the court system. It has. We have had to curtail our activities. We've had to streamline our staff uh, during these lockdown periods, you know, to just essential workers working on a roster system in, in order to protect the health and well-being of our staff and the members of the public. So I want to acknowledge that that has occurred. That the simple point I wish to make, Mrs. Black, is that all the essential urgent services that require for persons to address constitutional infractions or claims that, that their rights are being breached. Those services have always been available. Now, as I said, in the magistrate's court, there, there, there was a, a period of time, several months, where we were not hearing new civil claims, right? For reasons, again, that I could explain if we had the time. Um, we were actually just about to resume hearing civil matters when the new lockdown was announced. Um, and so as soon as this lockdown is lifted, we, we will be laying out for the public the procedures for starting new claims in the family court Excellent. and in the civil court. Uh, but, but constitutional motive matters are always urgent by their nature. And they could have been filed, they can be filed, and if they are filed, they will be dealt with in the appropriate manner by the judiciary. And, and, I, and I, if I may, I do want to acknowledge, because it's, it's only right that I do this, um, you know, the judicial officers, magistrates, um, and judges um, have been working very hard during this period of time. It would be a mistake to think that we were all home, um, you know, just waiting for the emergency to be lifted. That is not the case at all. Um, I could, if I had the time and, and, and anyone was interested, I could give you the statistics. We have heard scores and scores of applications. I would love to hear the statistics. Feel free. <laughs> well, no, I don't. I was going to say I don't have them. Oh, okay, up. okay. They could easily be obtained. Mm -hmm. We've been hearing. We've been hearing remote applications. Just for instance, yesterday, 
I, I was in a remote hearing with with um, five or six lawyers from from 10 a.m. until about 2:45, um, and and we had it, that was a judicial review case, which again is by its nature an urgent matter, um, and we had the hearing, um, and we got through our business, and 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 the matter was was going to be completed sometime next week, so the magistrates. Um, the, the staff and the super supervisors in the magistrate's court um, have been on the job. The, the Supreme Court judges um, have been available. Just because they may not be sitting in their office does not mean that they're not working from home. Um, and as I said, we've migrated to a remote platform and it's working quite well. Mm. Chief Justice Brian Murray, Chief Justice, I do appreciate uh, you coming on the show and clarifying that. And I think it's a very important point so that folks will know me. We are, I am aware of a, of a body of attorneys who are seeking to come uh, to present their petition with regard to uh, what they feel as if are constitutional matters. So I'm sure that they were aware and they just had us all in, all sitting, twiddling our thumbs, <laughs> not knowing, right? So it is excellent news. I think it's wonderful that we are able to clarify that, especially uh, since the era occurred on my show, and so I am honored that we were able to set that record straight. I know that you are a very busy man, and I do appreciate the time that you shared with us here. Um, so if you wanna add something else before we take a break. Well, just to thank you for the opportunity to clarify it. Um, I, I regard as part of my job is to inform the Bahamian public of, of what we are doing in the courts and to make sure that we account to the public. And I'm, I'm grateful for this opportunity on your show to do that. And the last point I would make is that I would encourage um, any member of the public and certainly all lawyers um, to monitor the website for the judiciary. Uh, it's www.bahamasjudiciary.com. Um, let me just make sure I've given it to you correctly. Um, www.bahamasjudiciary.com. We are, we are placing a lot of information on that website. Um, and if persons have any doubt as to what we are hearing, what we are not hearing, when the registries are open, when they're not open, what can be done in the magistrate's court, all of this information is on our website. And one final point, there is a special COVID-19 help desk button on our website, which is right at the very top of the home page. So if anybody has any questions about um, any of these procedures or if they've been trying to get to court or they're trying to file a document and they've not been able to do so, they should go to the COVID-19 help desk on the website. Um, it's very easy, very user-friendly. Click on the button and they can just send a short note, type it as to what their problem is and all they need to do is press submit. And then that message is, is directed to the office of the registrar um, and that help desk is cleared out every day, right? Every 24 hours that help desk um, site is cleared. So if you write, um, you will get a response and, and we try to provide this as a public service. So we can, we can address any issues which any member of the public may have. You know, there was a question that came to mind just now, Chief Justice. And the question that came to mind is a question that, uh, or statement that people have a lot of and um, and it's a matter of if there's a feeling as if the justice system is not fully, is not functioning well, that it, that there are, we, we hear about um, the backlog of cases, we hear about where people feel as if you don't have wealth, you don't have that type of money, you're going to suffer longer, that the representation is um, within uh, the judicial system services those who have, and I think that's across the board in your, and anywhere in the world, people feel as if you can get better representation with the more money you pay, which is, makes sense. But do you feel as if the confidence that the Bahamian people sitting in your chair and uh, looking now from the inside out, but once being on the outside, looking in, do you think the Bahamian people should have confidence in our judicial system, that it is strong and healthy? Fundamentally, I think the answer to that is yes. Um, now, public confidence in the administration of justice is absolutely critical to our democracy. Um, and that is why, as Chief Justice, I'm so um, concerned about addressing issues of public confidence. And when there are issues in the public domain, it is my duty and my job to address them. 
Um, and as I said a moment ago, I'm very serious when I say that, that we are accountable to the Bahamian people. And I, I fully recognize that. And I feel the weight of that every day in my job. So that's the first point. The second point, um, there is every reason to have confidence in our system um, because we, first of all, we, we have um, an independent judiciary, which is not subject to any external influences um, that, that, that I am aware of. And I don't think we've had any documented cases that I'm aware of. So, so we, we have a strong independent judiciary. We have a competent judiciary. Um, we have a judiciary which is impartial. Um, there are times when litigants are unsuccessful and they may complain about what a judge did or what a magistrate did. But institutionally, um, the independence and competence and impartiality of our judiciary, I think, is a model um, throughout the region. Now, having said that, I, I must go on to say that we, like countries all over the world, have serious systemic challenges within our court system. Um, there is no question about that. In fact, one of the primary reasons why um, I, I am in this job um, was to try and bring to the court system and to the judiciary a program of reform and modernization. Uh, and that, that is my strong intention. That is my mandate. Um, that is, that is my, the reason why I'm here. And we are working very hard to do that. So we, we have many challenges. We have, we have very limited financial resources. Our technology platform is in serious need of upgrading. Um, we, have, we are understaffed um, seriously in the judiciary. Our physical court buildings are in some cases in very poor condition. Um, and and we, have, we have challenges that we are facing. And so I acknowledge that. Um, I, I think around the world, judiciaries and court systems have these perennial problems. We do have backlogs, um, which again is a problem that every court system seems to have. And, and it's gone on you know, for, 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 for scores of decades. Um, we're, not, we're not taking it lightly. Um, I am trying to reduce the disposition cycle for cases throughout the court system. By reducing, by, 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 by reducing the disposition cycle, what I mean simply is to reduce the time period it takes from when you start a case to when you finish a case. And we've been looking at that very seriously. There are a lot of moving parts within the administration of justice which have to be looked at. And any real effective sustainable solution, Mrs. Black, has to be done on an holistic basis. Because for instance, um, take our criminal justice system. We've been looking very hard um, at the length of time it takes to get a case from when the person is charged in the magistrate's court to when his, his case is finished in the Supreme Court. Mm -hmm. And let's, let's, let's take a simple example um, of, of, a, of, of perhaps um, a case where somebody is charged with, with shooting somebody else, you know, attempted murder or murder. And there's a, there's a, there's, there's, there's been a, um, a gun involved in, in the, in the offense. So clearly whenever you have a shooting, you have to have ballistics reports, mm -hmm. you know, you need forensic evidence. Now I'm just giving you an example or take for instance, a murder case where clearly you need evidence from the pathologist right. you know, concerning the death of the, of the deceased. Now, systemically, it has been, t we, 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 are, we are currently taking, and when I say we, I mean the system, because you know, the, the, the pathologist and, and the, the, the pathology department are not directly under the control of the Chief Justice. The ballistics department you know, in the lab is not under control mm -hmm. of the Chief Justice. So we have a lot of stakeholders, um, social and welfare, um, BDOCs, uh, probation, um, Sanderlin's Rehabilitation Center, all of these uh, stakeholders are part of the administration of justice. So if we get to a point in the court system where we can reduce, say, the, the time that you have to wait for a trial in a murder case to, say, nine months or 12 months, you know, at the moment, it's taking us anywhere from nine to 18 months to get a pathologist report. Oh, my God. It, 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 can, take, it can take sometimes 12 months to get a report um, on the ballistics, on a ballistics report out of the lab. So the challenge is the stakeholders. Let me just make this point, DNA evidence, um, you know, because that has to be, be sent away. It can take 18 months to get results for, a D, for DNA evidence. Now, what I'm trying to say, I'm not, I'm not trying to be critical here. I'm just trying to explain 
that no matter what we do in the court system, and we are trying very hard to focus on these issues, we will have limited success if we cannot have an holistic approach to solving these problems with regard to all of the stakeholders who are involved in the administration of justice. Mm. In the administration of justice, you have, just to name a few, you have the, the Office of the Director of Public Prosecutions. You know, that's the, that's the, the Office of the State which prosecutes criminal matters. Mm -hmm. We call it the DPP's office. You have the DPP's office. You have the private defense bar. You have uh, BDOCs. You have law enforcement. You have many times um, pathologist reports. You have DNA reports. You have ballistic reports. You have probation. We have an office known as the office, the public defender's office, um, which defends persons who are, uh, do not, cannot afford a lawyer in certain types of cases. All, and I, I'm just naming a few of them. I've named right. probably seven or eight. If we don't fix all of those, whatever we do in the court system is gonna have limited success, all right? And that is really the, the, the message that I've been trying to communicate. Um, if we are gonna get serious about fixing our, our court system and the administration of justice, we are gonna have to address this whole problem across the board um, in order to have sustainable solutions. Now, this is being made more difficult by, by Dorian, um, mm -hmm. of course, you know, when we had a, a, a catastrophe um, and, and all of the financial impact. And then of course, um, it was even compounded by, by COVID-19, right? Where it's had a, had, a, had a catastrophic effect on many aspects of the economy and upon the availability of funding and our resources. So, so, you know, these problems were difficult before Dorian and COVID-19. So imagine now. Exactly, now they become more difficult, but we cannot give up um, and we are not giving up. We are staying very focused, very disciplined. Um, we've had to adjust our plans, um, but we have work to do. And I just want the behaving public to know um, that, that while we acknowledge that we have some systemic problems in the system, it is fundamentally um, a, a, a judiciary which is independent, impartial, competent. Um, the public needs to have faith in the system and they need to know that we're working very hard to try and modernize it and to reform it. But it's gonna take a big effort across the board. Um, I think, um, you know, I, I came here with that specific focus um, and I thought it was an opportunity to provide some public service which which I feel very strongly about, and that is what I am trying to do. Chief Justice, thank you so much for your time. I'm hoping that we get to do this another time when, because uh, I have a, a cadre of questions that I wish I could ask you, but time is limited for both of us. Thank you so much once again for um, letting us know exactly what's going on with the Supreme Court, that it is indeed open for business and it was never closed even when the island had closed down and that it was it is finding itself at limited capacity because three of its um uh what is not departments what would you call them you call them the family the registries, the registries. The three registries yes uh three of them are down but uh, civil and criminal are both up correct, correct. yes and, and i might add the other the, the other three family probate and, and appeals um we, we have still a provision if people need access, you know, to any files that there is a provision for them to, to contact the registrar. So the fact that they're closed doesn't mean we're not hearing any family matters. I want to make that clear. Okay. You can file all your family documents, you know, at the cashier's counter, which I mentioned. And Anne's Barker, one. And, and I should also acknowledge very quickly, Mrs. Black, you know, we have, we have courts in, in Grand Bahama and in Abaco. So I don't want to forget those courts. Um, those courts have also, with, with certain limitations, we have also provided essential services um, in those courts during this difficult time. And of course, Freeport, um, you know, was in a lockdown before New Providence. So we're working on all of those issues. But we, we have we have people working hard in those islands as well. Thank you so much, Chief Justice Maury. You're listening to The Hit Bag with Nahaja Black. When we come back, let's dive into today's hot topics. And then at the five o'clock hour, we're going to be talking about with a, a lovely technician and educator herself about how do we as parents and as schools 
get ourselves technologically savvy and ready to encounter a new school year that is going to require us to be virtual. God help us all. You're listening to The Hit Back with Nahaja Black. We'll be back right after this. The Ward and Sewage Corporation advises the public, its customers, and the residents of Washington Street from Robinson Road to Quarter Avenue that the corporation will commence improvement works on Thursday, August 6, 2020, for a period of six weeks. During this period, there may be interruption in the water supply, road closure, and detour around the work areas. Motorists are asked to avoid the area where possible between the hours of 9 a.m. and 2 p.m. daily. The corporation apologizes for any inconvenience caused and appreciates your support as they work to improve their level of service. This is Guardian Radio 96.9 FM. Fresh news, smart talk, all day. And we're back. You're listening to the Hit Back with Nahaja Black right here on Guardian 96.9 FM. You can also follow us live on YouTube. That's what we're doing right now, aren't we, high tech? So you can follow us live on YouTube. You can type in Nahaja Black. You will see us streaming live there as we are in the pandemic, you know? I mean, hey, what else you got to do? Sit and get ready to be entertained, you know? Great um, bit of information there. I was uh, happy to hear that the Chief Justice of the Supreme Court is still functioning, it's still working. Uh, that was my error yesterday. I think the dame was unaware of it herself, of course. Um, but we now know that the Supreme Court is open and that anyone with claim, uh, in particular the dame, I know for a fact that there are attorneys at present working on their petition. And with regard to the constitutional challenges that the uh, Prime Minister uh, the competent authority is presented with all of these lockdowns. The dame yesterday said we must be under house arrest. I was surprised. I don't know why I'm surprised. Whenever the dame is on, it's just one of those things where you, you end up in the news, yeah? You end up in the news because the dame has so much fire. She's so much to say. Um, you will definitely find yourself um, waiting and, 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 and uh, in some headline because she makes great points. So special shout out to the dame. Dame Joan Sawyer, I think it was wonderful points on the constitutional aspects of the um, of what's going on with the lockdown and how much are we willing to give up? That's the question. How much are we willing to give up? Um, and if you're not willing, I'm not the type willing to give up a lot of my rights and freedoms. I, I'm just not there. I say, and it's a Chinese proverb, tell me and I'll, you know, I'll forget. Show me. I'll remember, involve me, I will understand. That is it. We are being told what to do. We're not being walked through the process. We're not being walked through so that we can understand and take hold. We can take hold of this process, take hold of what is being required of us um, and asked of us so that we walk hand in hand with the competent authority. The challenge is the competent authority is, is using all of his powers to demand behavior change. And if you have children, you gotta realize at some point, beating don't change what they're doing. You know, it, is, it doesn't bend them and mold them like we think. You've got to get to the place where you help a child to understand. There was, a, there was I, I can give you a personal story. I remember when I was much younger, I'd always leave the top off of the five gallon bottle of water, always. And I always get out, make sure you put the top on the bottle. Make sure you put the top on the bottle. Man, I got riled so much for that until one day, my sister said to me, put the top back on the bottle because you don't want anything crawling in your water. That was it for me. She helped me understand why it was so important. That bit of information 
changed my behavior. It gave me an understanding of what's at stake. And you, you have to know that that is important. We have to know what's at stake when we are being asked to comply. And I believe that Bahamians know what's at stake. We look at the United States. The problem that the United States is having is that um, politics has made a pandemic a problem. Bahamians, I think we're smart enough to not allow politics to make a pandemic, a health crisis, a problem. So there is no argument about masks, about wearing your masks. I don't think anybody has a problem with wearing them. Majority of us are common sense people. We understand that we're learning. And as, as the information became public, we learned from that public information. We learned that, hey, before people weren't wearing masks, they said you didn't need to wear a mask. Now we have to wear a mask. We're wearing the mask because I don't want to get it from you. And I don't want you to get it from me. I don't want you to give it to my mother, to my mother-in-law, to my aunt. I don't want you to give it to these people. So we're wearing it, helping us to understand that we will wear it and we will comply. This is an issue of not, no, uh, of not complying. We're not the same as the United States, I believe, in our lack of compliance. I believe that the United States' issue, um, which by the way, they can't force people to wear these masks, by the way, they can't force them. That's the problem that they're having because it's a constitutional issue. They can't force them. They can suggest it. They can even fine you, but they can't force you, right? And so they're being, people are being appealed to, and it's gotten crazy because of politics and polarizing and mask wearing is some sort of, we hate Trump dumbness, but uh, I digress. This is where we are now, where there are certain constitutional rights that should not be infringed upon. We have said that, and now let's go to the next part of this. The next part of this is, there is a real health crisis going on. So I'm not with the dame and believing that it's not real. I do believe that this is a serious issue and you have to take it seriously, right? Um, you have to take it seriously. So now we have more nurses and doctors walking out today. They're like, they're not willing to work today. They're not interested in going to work. And so we're gonna have to figure this out ourselves. How do we um, make this function? The nurses and doctors are saying enough is enough. We've got word that 23, 20 odd persons from Sunderland's Rehabilitation Center, patients have tested positive. Where is the, the PPEs that are required, right? So this is a real issue across the board. This is a real health issue. We've got immigration officers who are sick. We've got police officers who are sick. So this is a real thing. How, do, how does this affect us? Now, we know that the morbidity is about 3%. Um, the mortality rate of this is about 3%. And that's pretty high. I mean, that's complicated for this debate. That's pretty high. And on the BBC today, just for the record, if you haven't been watching, on the BBC today, we have been put on a list of, if you go into the UK, you have to um, self-quarantine for 14 days. So that's how bad we are now. We're, we're in the self, international news is telling, we're that bad. So we have to comply. We have to be the type of people who want to do better. I believe that the pushback is, we will do better. Tell us what is needed, why it is needed, how long it is needed for, how do we, as we're doing this and, and staying home, how will we in 14 days look differently? You know what I don't like? I don't like when the prime minister says, um, you know, we'll see if that's the, at minimum 14 days. I mean, I, uh, Mr. Prime Minister, Mr. Competent Authority, what you mean at minimum? I, I mean, at minimum, this is a game, eh? At minimum? At minimum. Now, mind you, I can still do my job from home. I'm doing my job from home. I'm using technology. I'm using it I'm at home. And I'm one of the fortunate ones. But others who can't, what are you supposed to do? How are we supposed to move forward in this crisis? And so that's, those are the questions that we need to, we need to push back on certain things. We cannot be the type of people, we cannot be the type of people who are so easy to give up your rights. I was telling you all this from the beginning, you know, that we seem to feel like a police state when you have the police officers yucking people off of buses in the middle of the day, as if this is, where are we living? I have problems with this. I have big problems with certain types of behavior. That's just who I am. I, I'm not gonna sit here and make it seem as if it's easy for me 
to give up rights. We do it at the beginning. We did it at the beginning because we all were in a position of little knowledge. Um, we were at a position where we were trusting administration to be good arbiters of our rights, not to infringe on them and looking out for our greater good. During these past six months, we are left with, not six months because it really started in March for us, but these past few months, we are left with more questions than answers. During these past few months, we've seen an, an inordinate amount of, of, of favoritism, right? Some people get stuff and allowed to do things while others don't. This administration has tripped over its own feet. And so this is, I mean, hey, this is where we are. Now we have, uh, and you know, I mentioned it yesterday, we got school that's, that's opening up. Um, and that's a whole other level of concern for parents, right? Concern for citizenry. What are we going to be doing? How are we going to embrace this and move forward with it? And that's a big deal to me too. And I think the next level is how, with so many people now out of work, how many, how is the public school system going to handle what I believe will be a new influx of students? How is the public school system handling that? We're talking about a virtual platform. Can the virtual platform handle all of the users? Because you're talking about from 500, 1700 users now to thousands of users. How is the platform going to be able to handle that? How are parents supposed to be able to, when you don't have a job, you're talking about a tablet, you know, man, this is, this is next level concerns, y'all. And uh, some schools are still requiring students to wear their uniforms. And if that is the case, you still gotta pay for your, your uniforms to go to start out the matter when school starts. And without having any idea of what the plan is, Every time there's a lockdown, every time there's a curfew, every time a business is told to close because someone got sick, rather than people are going to get sick, unfortunately, we're going to have to keep with the mitigation protocols. We're going to have to change our behaviors as a behavior as a nation. But business, when someone gets sick, you adjust. We have to stop, I, I, I agree with the name on this, we, we cannot run away or hide from this virus. I made note uh, yesterday with the measles. When people started, when people stopped taking the measles vaccine in the United States, they saw an increase in something that they felt was eradicated, which was measles. And the herd immunity was now depleting and it could cause a problem because people die from measles, right? Children dying from measles is a problem. What that showed to me was the disease or the virus didn't go anywhere. It's been there. It stays in the atmosphere. It's still in the atmosphere. When we get a vaccine, it works to help us all be immune to something. But it's, is this a virus, is this a, a coronavirus, um, part of the flu or, you know, um, influenza? Eh, it's upset of. Is that something that we can cure? I've had multiple people tell me, you know, you can't cure a flu or cold, so we're just gonna get immune to it, so we gotta figure out how to live with it. And COVID-19, y'all, is changing the way we live. COVID-19 is shutting us down. COVID-19 is bringing us to poverty. Poverty, people, 108,000 people, the prime minister said, is now eating from the food bank. We're feeding 108,000 people. We're a country of 400,000 folks, give or take. That's a quarter of the population. We, aren't, we weren't able to take a census because of Dorian, because people were moving about. Now, God help us, when you look at the fact that we have COVID-19, people can't go door to door. So what is the real number? What is the real number for folks who are unemployed in the country? We know how many doing unemployment checks, benefits, but what is it across the board? People who can't get NIB because their employer didn't pay. So we are looking at a, a total breakdown of our economic system, a total breakdown of our society. And we must now retool, reshift. And without any form of leadership or plan that can tell us how to retool and reshift, these lockdowns cause more frustration. They're causing frustration. And I don't know. I think the second wave is, is 
definitely, we know the second wave is worse than the first. Bad decisions by the government and the people has led us to where we are today. But I guarantee you, would it, would we have ran? Would we have shut everything down if we still ended up with 60 people positive in New Providence? With 70 people positive in Grand Bahama? We've got to figure out at some point that we can't keep shutting it down. We have to find a way to restructure, retool, rebuild, find a way. I mean, there are great ideas that have been put forth. I believe that the Economic Recovery Committee has, has some good ideas. We'll see what happens, but I'll tell you this. If we can now get each island to be COVID free from the least populated to the most, from everyone that's a small island, Auckland, Inangua, Ragged Island, can we go there, test these people? If, they're, if everyone is COVID free, you deem that island COVID free. Wouldn't Ragged Island benefit from some tourists right now? Wouldn't Auckland benefit far flung islands that ain't got nobody but got beautiful beaches? Wouldn't they get a revitalization? Wouldn't those people now have a better stake on their island where they say, you know what? Let me build a little two bedroom hut and see what's going on. As someone says during the second lockdown, do you think the government is using this time to come up with new ideas? So when we open the third lockdown wouldn't be necessary. Well, that's what they say. That's what they're saying. They're saying that they wanna know that they're gonna be able to during this lockdown or during, I guess the rest of our ever, you know, that um, we're gonna have ideas. Last point here. All right, folks, we need to calm down that Bill Gates was in the country. We need to calm down. There's too many things to worry about than to worry if Bill Gates is here to not give us a whole cadre of laptops, but rather some vi vaccine that we're afraid of. Don't stress yourself out about these things, man. Don't stress yourself out. So just make sure you ain't in the first round of vaccines then. I don't for sure, I won't be. I just <laughs> don't stress yourself out, ladies and gentlemen. Find yourself, uh, you know, I found out today that my former principal and uh, the father of one of my producers has passed away. And I found out also today that my aunt on my husband's side, so my step aunt, is gravely ill, right? And that we don't know how long she has left. I remember in earlier in this year, January, we had to bury my grandmother. And I think my, one of my good friends had lost her grandmother during this pandemic. All of that to say this is that people are going through a lot we are still struggling to cope, but life is still moving forward. Spend the time that you have with the people that you love. Do not get caught up deep into conspiracy theories. Do not fear what you don't know, because that's really what fear is. False evidence appearing real. Save yourself that headache and heartache. Carla says, no NIB, no job, no home, no social services, and no food bank assistance, no sanity. The struggle is real for many. I've seen people who want to commit crimes so they can get a meal and a bed in jail. Yeah, that's some crazy stuff. Listen, we're going to take a quick break. When we come back, we will be chatting it up with a young woman who is a very smart young woman. And this, this, this part of the show I wanted to do because this is helpful for all of us parents who are now looking at putting our kids in school this coming school year. What does it mean to be on a virtual platform? Some of us have to determine, are we homeschooling? Some of us have to determine, you know, how much of our sanity are we prepared to lose in this process? Shoots, I'm even curious, is sending my kid to school even safe? You're listening to The Hit Back with Nahaja Black live here on Guardian 96.9 and streaming live on YouTube. Everyone, we will be back right after this. Peace. 
is Guardian Radio 96.9 FM. Fresh news, smart talk, all day. You're listening to the Guardian News Network. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Taylor Ferguson. Here's what's making news. Thank you so much for tuning in. The Public Hospitals Authority and Sandlin's Rehabilitation Center confirming today 23 people on the male ward tested positive for COVID-19 after a staff member who worked across three wards of the institution tested positive. Of the patients testing positive, six presented with symptoms and another 17 were asymptomatic officials confirmed this in a statement. All affected patients are now being cared for on isolated wards. The statement continued aggressive sanitization of wards at the institution continues. The statement came hours after Bahamas Nurses Union President Amancho Williams made the revelation on the COVID-19 cases at Sandlin's Rehabilitation Center. At least 20 nurses have called in sick at the Rand Memorial Hospital. Bahamas Nurses Union President Amantra Williams confirming to the Nassau Guardian today. Nurses have called in sick. That's what we, we, I've gotten the report to, today that nurses call in sick. They sick? Prime Minister better do something before the whole country shut down. You got no nurses nowhere. Can't stop them. You need to, he need to do something. Give them what you promised them. Sort them out. Provide them with the equipment that they need to work with when they go into to this type of um, dealing with this these type of patients. You have to do what you have to do. The Public Hospitals Authority is branding reports that there is a lack of personal protective equipment to support the thousands of healthcare workers across the country as false and malicious. Dozens of medical technicians from PMH walked off the job today over lack of PPEs and social distancing protocols. Bahamas Public Services Union Executive Vice President O'Neill Thurston said they were ongoing concerns. In a statement today, the Public Hospitals Authority said it continues to restock elevated quantities of PPEs to equip persons across the entire healthcare system, inclusive of hospitals and clinics in New Providence and the Family Islands. And at no time was this resource under threat. As a matter of standard operating procedures, the supply levels of PPEs is closely monitored. The authority said it finds it regrettable that some would seek to generate false reporting which can only be designed to engender panic amongst members of the public. That's what's making news. I'm Taylor Ferguson. AP News is coming up next. Tired of banks forcing you to use technology to bank the way they want you to? Your convenience is important. So no matter what your banking needs, Commonwealth Bank's friendly staff are always available in branch for that personal one-on-one service. But when you choose technology, our online and mobile banking app offers you state-of-the-art functionality. The choice is yours. Commonwealth Bank. Bank the way you want. Coronavirus update. I'm Ed Donahue with an AP News Minute. Stocks ended the day higher. The Dow up 185 points. About 1.2 million people filed claims for unemployment last week. The AP Shelley Adler has more on what the number means. It's the 20th straight week that at least 1 million people have applied for jobless aid. But as Bankrate.com's senior economic analyst Mark Hamrick tells us, there was a glimmer of hope. We have seen week over week increases for two weeks straight with these new jobless claims. So we finally uh, get another decline in the weekly numbers, down 249,000. There was also an update on total jobs loss due to COVID-19. That number is quite eye-popping, I have to say. Uh, more than 30 million, 31 million claims were being paid uh, very recently. The July jobs report is due out Friday. I'm Shelley Antler. Meantime, negotiations continue on Capitol Hill on a new coronavirus economic relief bill. I'm Ed Donahue. This is Guardian Radio 96.9 FM. Fresh news, smart talk, all day.
And we're back. You're listening to the hit back with Nahaja Black. It's good to have everybody uh, on air, listening to us, watching, etc. cetera. Um, well, listen, we are in a new, I guess, space and time where we have to adjust. And the adjustment is real, y'all. The adjustment is real. And um, I am excited to have on the show with us uh, a very smart young woman. I like smart people. Smart people make me look smarter, especially knowing full well that I need all the help I could get. <laughs> um, uh, teacher, IT professional, Zena Dean. Zena, how are you? I'm great. Can you hear me? I can hear you well. You're good. You're okay, that's good. that's good. That's good. Thanks for having me on the show today. Listen, it's a pleasure to have you. All right, Zena. So this is where we are today, right? Where we are today is that we are getting set for a September where most schools are opening in September, September 14th. The uh, Minister of Education has stated, listen, everybody's going to school. Education is pivotal. It's vital. And uh, I could not agree more, right? Mm -hmm. I think all of us agree that education is... Um, it's huge. We need it to be, you know, we need it to be a part of our everyday existence. Our children need to go to school. But this year will be unlike any other, right? And considering yeah. that our kids have not been in school since um, March, for God's mm -hmm. sake, I'm seeing way too much <laughs> of my kids. <laughs> um, they've been in school, they've been out of school since March. Yeah. And I think everybody had a sample of what this virtual learning would be like. Um, what it's like to learn remotely. Uh, I'm telling you, I'm not, I'm not a huge fan. Uh -huh. And uh, schools have struggled, schools struggled. And it showed us just how antiquated we are when it comes to technology. Some schools were better off. Those are the mm -hmm. high flying expensive schools, you know, oh. the ones that tend to be out <laughs> west and that one out <laughs> east, right? Yes, I know. What Maybe that mean? one on Blair, uh, on, 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 on Village Road might've been okay. I don't know, but, uh, and they're a little steep too, but they ain't like that one all the way out east and those two all the way out west, I'll tell you that. Um, but you know, it, it has been different. And what you present to, uh, what, you, what you and I have been chatting about is how technology today, and mm -hmm. technology in particular in education, why is it so important and how do we shift? And so my first question to you, Zena, being someone who has helped to create an uh, education platform locally on how we can you know, disseminate and create a space for people to uh, learn. How difficult, how far are we from an adaptive educational system, an adaptive IT educational platform? That would be proper. Mm, okay, you asked a good question. I just want to thank you again for inviting me on the show. So happy to be here. Um, yeah. I didn't have anywhere to go. I had to stay in the house. So. <laughs> Let's so, do this. <laughs> so it's perfect. I think, um, I think the Bahamas is making some strides, but I still feel that we have a, a long ways to go. And why I say that, um, just based on my experience, because I've been to various institutions, I've been to the international school, I wouldn't call any names, but everybody knows what I mean. I've been to the international schools. I've been to the private schools. I've um, been in public school for, for a little bit. Mm -hmm. um, so I've had the opportunity to see a lot of things in action. And from what I would say, what the international schools do well is that they, their systems are based on the IB, right? The International mm -hmm. Baccarat Program. So they focus a lot on inquiry for students, students and even with teachers, inquiry, collaboration. Those things are tenants, right, of, of, of the program. So kids from day one, from preschool all the way up to high school, they are immersed in that type of atmosphere where you are, you know, always asking questions. You want to know why. You are developing, you know, those reasoning skills, those inquiry skills, and things kind of mesh together. So there's always application in what is being done. And I think what COVID has kind of like done to us has kind of like shifted us and thrown us in the place where, okay, application now has to come center stage, 
right? Mm-hmm. And are we in our regular system, right? Even when we look yeah. at the public school, the private school, are we actually pushing our children to apply knowledge, to be mm. able to put all of the puzzle pieces together? And I think what has happened too is that technology was seen as a elective subject or a yeah. little side subject um, that you go to a specialist um, yeah. class. And um, because of the pandemic, I think parents, parents, administrators were able to see, okay, technology is important. Technology is a language. It's another literacy. So just another language, I right? Love that. So, right. So just like how students need to have English skills, math skills, numeracy skills, application skills, you have to be technology literate. And there's a difference between be like a throw around, oh, my child is tech savvy. There's a yeah. difference between a child being tech savvy and a child being technology literate. You would find that a lot of children, yes, they can pick up a tablet, they can pick up a phone, they know how to WhatsApp, they can they can swipe left, call, they can swipe right. right. They can take pictures and, yep. and do all the cute videos and stuff like that. Um, but you still find that there's a need. Children need to be taught um, certain technology terms. They need to be taught certain technology skills. Because at the end of the day, technology is used in every subject area that you have to, that you have to be involved in. And yep. if you have a technology deficiency, it's going to put you at a setback in every subject area, especially if you're talking about moving to a fully online learning environment, the technology literacy skills are the basis. Let me ask you something. Even, yes. Mm-hmm. I'm sorry, I, I have to ask this before, before I lose this train of thought on something you said. Okay. Technology literacy. We, we must move from being, because this talk of tech savvy, what you're saying is we're still tech illiterate. Our children are still technologically illiterate because what we deem as tech savvy as parents is really just the basics of using devices, really, right? Like, what, you know, 2020, uh, well, a child born from 95 and, well, she's, yeah. you know, let's say early 80s. We, we are a part of that technological wave, but then you mm-hmm. have some who were born in technology, born into tech, born into the internet, know only about um, the iPod touch, not the iPod or the first gen, you know, right. iPhones. So what does it mean for me? What, what does it mean that I'm illiterate uh, in technology? Because that's important. Man. I, you didn't say illiterate, I did. Like, yeah, I didn't say that. You, you I didn't, didn't say, say that. illiterate. I, would say I said it. She <laughs> sounds more politically correct. If it's, if it's, that you seems more PC. But all I heard was, how's you dumb? <laughs> um, you're, you're growing. There, there are different, um, okay, when we look at technology in general, right? There are various skills when I look at from little ones from preschool, primary, high school, right? When I'm finished with um, primary school or elementary school, elementary school, there are certain skills, there's a certain skill set that I should have. There are certain categories when we talk about in relation to technology. It's not just the keyboarding, it's not just the video video production. Do you know the history of computers? Um, Do you know how to use word processing programs? And not just Microsoft Word now. I'm talking about, can you transfer those skills from Microsoft Word to like a Google Doc? Or if I place you on a, just a standardized word processing program, do you know how to transfer the skills that you may have learned in one program? Mm -hmm. You understand Mm -hmm. what I mean? There's, um, when we talk about digital citizenship, that is a big issue for us for schools now. So schools have to pay attention to and devote time to teaching children sound digital citizenship skills. How do I act online? How do I act online? How do I search for information properly? My digital footprint, knowing that, okay, whatever I post out there on social media, even if I go to delete it or whatever it is, it still exists Mm. in the digital stratosphere. So like these are are, are key things like that children, that children need to know because you find a lot of parents and I would even talk about myself. Let me just give a shout out to my husband before I get a row on. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Please do. <laughs> YouTube. Hi, babes. Um, I my son Aiden. Okay. Uh, so he knows that I shouted him out. All yes. right. So even with, even with me, with um, 
with my son, right? I wouldn't mm-hmm. call it Holy Ghost too. So I experienced my own baptism by fire um, with him, whatever, being home and having to deal with all of this uh, work coming in at, at one time. And then certain skills that I thought he knew how to do, he didn't know how to do. So I had to stop. We had to stop before I get frustrated, right? And we had to go over some things. So I had to go over, okay, scanning a document. Mm. All right? Scanning a document on your three-in-one, all-in-one printer versus scanning a document from your phone. These are different skills. So, you know, we went through different apps. I showed him what to do. How old is Um, your son? He's 12, right? So I showed him what to do. Um, He hooked up. I showed him how to connect his um, Gmail account. So he had his Gmail account on his phone and he scanned the work and, you know, and he was just sending all at all. That like, it saved me. So I think too, with, with, with parents as well, I think once parents understand that, okay, what prerequisites does my child need in order for him or her to flourish in the online learning environment? Because I think online learning um, just from looking at my social media and interacting with parents and, and whatnot because of the pandemic. And the first time we had to shut down school, some parents have a bit of taste in their mouth regarding online learning, right? That's an understatement. And, that, you know. <laughs> and it's not the fact that online learning is bad, you know. It may have been how the school chose to go about um, presenting online learning. It may have been also, too, that there were multiple platforms that the parent and the child had to juggle, um, you know, and there was no, how could I say it? There was no Mm pre-training for the parent or the child. You're very good with words. I like you. (laughs) Thank you. So it, it, it made things a bit difficult. And then communication. So see, because we have to go into the online stratosphere now, right? See the face-to-face, when we're in school, face-to-face, right? Or when we have to do with education, face-to-face, right? We could say a lot of things. Um, you know, we're able to clearly explain ourselves. You know, if we need to correct ourselves right then and there, we can do it. In the online environment, it doesn't allow for all of that. Mm-hmm. So That's right. everything has to be laid out clearly. Okay, what platform is my child expected to use? How long are y'all going to be using this platform? Um, what hours can I contact um, my child's teacher? Yes. You know, so that was another another issue. I'll just speak on behalf of teachers like, okay, parents, we you can't contact us 24 hours a That's day. Right. At 8 p.m. You, you, you can't be messaging me hours. 11 o'clock in the night <laughs> and expect me to, you know, it's not the hotel. Actually, mm-hmm. And you know what? That's a great point. I have to ask this question. Yeah. I noticed when my kids were doing, when we finally figured out what the platform was, right? Mm-hmm. We finally figured out what this, what we were using, which ended up being Google Classroom. Okay. It took a long time to get to that point. And by the time we did school, the semester was coming to an end. The school year was coming to an end. So you ended up with like two weeks of that sort of, <laughs> that, that structured learning, right? Uh-huh. So that was a whole other level of frustration there. But what I, what I wanted or was trying to figure out during that, that process, right, was that how much of that, that, when you talk about three hours, so the children go to school from nine to three, mm-hmm. right? I had uh, teachers teaching the kids from, from, you know, like one to three. That, mm. that can't be the right number. And then you had it from like 10 to, 10 to, to one. And I was mm-hmm. okay. Is learning, can online learning be that condensed mm. or do we just miss a lot of content? Mm. But okay, let me bring up a few issues of concern. Okay. okay. Number one, we were thrown into the pandemic, right? Mm-hmm. So a lot of schools, like say for instance, I can't remember, I remember it was like around the time of my birthday, right? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, so basically we, you know, schools may have shut down that Friday and then we had to start the following week. So now you have a bunch of variables in, in, into play now because number one, the teachers, okay, the teachers who are your essential workers are now at home with home responsibilities as well with their children mm-hmm. around them. So when I'm at school, 
my child is also at school normally, okay? So yeah. I don't have little Johnny in the back of me saying, hey, mommy, I need a sandwich, <laughs> or I can't get my laptop to work, or, you know, whatever it is, you know? So, so that, so true, even in my situation, right? A lot of times I was doing live lessons, right? And my mm-hmm. son, although he's a little bit older, he still wasn't, like, understanding. He would come, he'd hold the paper in front of me. What am I supposed to do, right? And I'm there, like, hold on, boys this, and girls. This boy don't move. And I'm like, boy, tell you're trying to teach, <laughs> right? But then at the same time, right, uh, my challenge, okay, do I... I'm teaching from nine to whatever time. Very nine good point. To, I put all my all my classes together, right? Nine mm-hmm. to a particular time, right? And then at the end of the day, the I do I have to put my child on the back burner? That's so true. Or her edu- education because I have to deal with them way after way after the fact. So you have the variable of okay, nobody is there to take care of my children, mm-hmm. basically, right? Mm-hmm. So that's that's one. That's number one. That's a big one. Right. That's number one. Number two, um, a lot of schools didn't have a clear platform to say, okay, well, this is going to be our platform for using, for doing video conferencing for the students. All right. Some schools just left it up to the teacher and say, hey, okay, whatever you come up with, um, you go ahead and, and you could use that or whatever it is. So you already have uh, a lack of standardization. So I said some schools now nah, not bashing everybody. So every teacher was doing his or her own thing. Some teachers pay for accounts. And yeah. I think parents don't see these things sometimes that happen in the background. There are a lot of things that there are a lot of um, extra fees that teachers take on just to make sure that they are doing their best and they're giving your child um, the best. Even teachers yeah. who are some of my friends who work for public school, who work for private school, we dig in our, in our, in our um, all, all the time. even on a regular even yeah. on a regular basis. So even in my classroom, I have supplies, I have pencils, I have colored pencils, I have crayons, whatever it is. So you can't come to me with an excuse. Me. I don't, Miss Dean, I don't have my supplies today. Go to pencil box. Go get your mm. pencil, go get this, go get that. Right? So you have an inconsistency with, um, how can I say it? With platform. Yes. Right? Um, and then I would just say life. Life happened. Nobody expected the pandemic to happen. So we were all trying to, and, and especially now, like it's a day by day thing. Like you don't know when the prime minister is going to You don't know what is going on. on. You know, right. and every time I had a prime minister going to have an address. You get anxiety. Right. Oh my gosh. My stomach starts to bubble. <laughs> like, oh gosh, what's going to happen now? So, you know, everybody was trying to like navigate. So it was almost like a, like a trial run, you know, yeah. and sad to say, um, you know, I think our children, I don't want to say suffered, but they were part of the trial run. Process. They were part of this trial they, run. They, they were, you know, and then you have so much. Um, and I think one of the things we talked about a little bit earlier in previous conversation is the fact that in our country, there's not enough digital equity. Yes. Right? So it. you have kids um, who may not have access, who come from households where, okay, uh, the electricity don't be on all the time. That's mm-hmm. a part of life. They yeah. go into the pump to get water, right? So me going to the pump to get water is more important than me doing my homework or me going to an online lesson. I got to watch my brother and sister because um, mommy, has to go, mommy has to go to work, right? Mm-hmm. Or you may not even have a sensible device. You may just have a cell phone, right? And you can't expect a child. So this, this is another pet peeve that I have as well. Some of the things that I, I see going on that schools are sending out. Right? right, you can't just tell um, a parent. I guess depending on what level the child is at. But if I'm in upper primary to elementary, my child just can't bring a tablet to school. Right, right. So it's how, not, how does that even and, work? unless unless it is uh, something that is robust, you know, unless it is something that is robust. Like when we talk about um, an iPad Pro, right, or Microsoft Surface Pro, something that is yes. robust. That can, can handle handle, the handle me going, handle me doing um, live streaming and connecting with different apps to complete my work. Like you know, par- parents too. Like okay, we know that we're still in this wave, yeah. and the possibility of even when school closed, 
the possibility of having to go virtual again, like that was filling yeah. everybody's mind. Yeah. So persons, I would have encouraged parents who have the funds, who have the resources, give your child a device. Purchase a device that your child can use. Now, me, everybody, it's not that, you know. Yeah. You let me, let me, yeah. There's, mm -hmm. a, there's a point that you made that I, I love the point that you made. If you're just tuning in, you have a proficient. And Zena, please give me your all of your wonderful titles so that I get them right. Um, I know that you are a teacher. You're an entrepreneur. Uh -huh. uh, you are. Um, give me your tech savvy information there. My I, tech I, savvy? I, uh, I'm a teacher. I'm a teacher mm -hmm. by day. That's my full time job. I'm a tech teacher, primary primary tech teacher. Um, I lecture part time at UV mm -hmm. um, in a school of business. Also, mm -hmm. I should say in the CIS department. That's what right? I mean. Yeah, yeah. I am a NARPOD certified educator. I am on the FETC, which is I think one of the third largest educational technology. Conferences what, in what the is that US. called again? FETC, Future of Education Technology Conference. So it's a big Could conference that happens every year. Um, and I've spoken to it a couple of years in a row. And then like last year, they invited me to be a part of the Educator Review Committee. So um, on that committee, you have the opportunity to evaluate um, potential presentations for the conference from wow. people who are applying from different parts of the world. Um, so that, You're Bahamian, that, that just is for the good. record. Beautiful yeah. Bahamian woman. Thanks. <laughs> just want to show off a little bit. Go ahead, darling. <laughs> yeah. So yeah. So that's just yeah. That's your credentials, yeah. Work it. That's right. that's the credentials. Yeah. I, okay. I wanted I wanted that to be said there because I we're going to have to dig it. Uh, we're going a little deeper even into this conversation of of the equity. But I, you mentioned something about the devices. That mm -hmm. is number one on the list, right? get mm -hmm. either a tablet or a, a laptop, right? And you, something very important, I think a lot of people don't know because they're not uh, necessarily, um, what, what was the phrase you used? Technologically- Literate. Literate, yeah. Literate, yeah. And yeah. they wouldn't understand, because um, I've seen people say tab seven. I've owned mm -hmm. a tab seven. Um, mm -hmm. And I'm sorry, they're not that great. I just, <laughs> it's just, I, not, I mean, you know, they're not bad, uh -huh. but when you try to do <laughs> multiple things on it, you kind yeah. of find out how good it is. And it made me wonder, what mm. are we doing on these tablets? What mm. platforms or softwares that are educational tools that we're actually using? Mm -hmm. Because I would, is it just so that we can do the Zoom classes? You know, I, mm. I know that there are robust educational systems mm -hmm. that, um, but things can work all together. I'm curious, do you know what we're using on these tablets or these laptops? Because tab seven ain't no, ain't no iPad or, or no Surface Pro. I'll tell you that, it ain't, it sounds let good. Say, but... Let me tell you one of the issues um, we, ra we um, ran into and I will just um, speak generally. In doing live lessons, right? Um, because I'm a technology teacher, right? So the first set of lessons that um, would have happened over the COVID, right? I would have been introducing the children to the platform, um, that whatever that we were using. And um, in order to kind of like support what their teachers were doing. So it made things a little bit easier. So when you give assignments, the children know where to go, what to do, you know, and whatever, piggybacking off of that, right? Mm -hmm. Because everybody had different devices, when it came time now to, okay, it moved from me be, me lecturing and we having discussions and all that stuff to you actually doing, doing work online during class time, some students couldn't do it mm -hmm. because the device was not robust enough and only allowed for video calls, me to be on the, on the app. I couldn't um, multitask and go over into a document and go over into the learning management system that we were doing. So some kids were at a disadvantage and they couldn't complete the work right then and there. They had to do it after the class time. So that is why it's important for schools going into September, you have to look at, okay, what is the curriculum requiring, right? And right. because now with COVID, certain things we got to scratch out of the curriculum because it may not be mm. of that, you know, important yeah. or, or certain things in the curriculum, okay, if I give you 
a video to watch and I give you some online questions, or online quiz answer, bam, we already finished with that topic. So you have to look at the end in mind. What is it? What are the skills that are going to be important for kids to master by the end of the year, right? What type of assignments do we want to be able to give? And now you're moving into a digital stratosphere, okay? It's not anything written on folder sheet. Yeah. Or me bringing the folder <laughs> to class, Very all true. right? For you to catch something or whatever it is. So my assessing of you has to be done digitally now, okay? And, sometimes, and that brings challenges if, if we don't know what we're doing. But it does bring advantages because kids do not lose their work. Yeah, that's and true. And that, that is one of the main, kids do not lose their work and they can build upon whatever it is that they were doing. That's so a very it's good a point. constant, very good point. It's, it's a constant, like, so there, there could be constant feedback between the teacher and the student on what needs to be adjusted in real time. So that's what technology has allowed us to do. Technology has allowed us to connect in real time with our, with, with our kids, right? Now I lost my train of thought now because I was talking well, so, so uh, much about what we were on. What, oh, with the, the device. Me? Yeah. Okay, with the devices. So schools have to now look at, okay, because you have to make time for the technology now, mm. for the technology skills, or else all th this thing will come crashing down if the kids don't have the skills in, in, in place. So those schools that weren't placing a full emphasis on, okay, teaching the children how to use, I wouldn't just say uh, the computer, how to use different devices or whatever it is, right? If you weren't having a focus on that, you're going to be at a, dis the children are going to be at a disadvantage. The parents are going to be frustrated. So you have to look at ways in which, how are you going to beef this up now with technology support? Technology support for the students, technology support for the parents, technology support for the teachers and mm. the administrators. All these things we have to look at. We have to look at the end game before we go saying, okay, you need to buy this particular device for your child. Because you need to know what is it that you're going to be requiring of the child. Yes. Because you can't come. I already spent uh, uh, $1,500 on a computer. And you could tell me this day, I need to get some more stuff. <laughs> I have four children in the house. So these are real issues now. I have real four issues. kids in the house. I have uh. four kids in the house. We already share our devices. I'm, you know, I'm struggling to put them in private school because I want them to have the best education. So like all these things, like schools have to plan ahead. So I think this leads to some parental frustrations when you are parents talking about, oh, I don't know what my school is doing. I don't know what the child school is doing and blah, 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 blah. I mean, some things uh, schools could plan for outright, right? But like with the COVID, <laughs> with the COVID pandemic, we don't know how school, like we can plan all we want, right? We can mm. have the health and safety protocols in place and everything, but not until we get back face to face. That's right. We're going to really see how those things are going. Those protocols to, actually work out. So that, how, those a, things are going, how those things are going to play out. And you know, we want to go back face, a lot of schools really want to go back face to face, but you would look at, oh, uh, you want to talk, sorry. Yeah, no, no, no. I, oh. I want to say, let's take a quick break. Okay. When we come back, um, We'll continue this conversation here with Zena Dean, uh, brilliant uh, technological mind, teacher, IT proficient, uh, teaches this to parents, to teachers and students. And, um, you know, she is, you know, look, if you need any help with how to prepare yourself technologically wise as well, I am pushing this young woman because she has impressed me tremendously. And I'm kind of disappointed that we just meet, you know, Zena, kind of <laughs> disappointed. <you know? laughs> What is yeah. going on here? I, I thought the Bahamas was small. We'll be back right after this. You're listening to the Hit Back with Nahaja Black. We'll be back right after this.
And we're back. You're listening to the Hit Back with Nahaja Black. Zena Dean here with us on the show. If you're following us live via YouTube, don't forget, you can follow us there. If you are following us there, obviously, if you're following us there, you didn't forget. But if you are following or you want to follow us live on YouTube, you want to watch the show later, you missed any part of the show, we had Chief Justice Brian Mori on at the beginning of the show talking about um, um, really bringing some clarity to yesterday's content. Um, yeah, with regard to the dame and where she had mentioned that the Supreme Court was closed, we can confirm that that is not the case. The Supreme Court was never closed. It was open and running, though minimally. It was running until the, from, actually never closed from the 17th. So that's important. If you missed any part of the show, feel free to do so. Some other big news is, before we get back to my guest is that it has been confirmed by the Commissioner of Police that there were 10 officers who have new officers who contracted the COVID virus. Um, wow. And uh, so that is a ever growing problem. Look, we have our men and women, we have our frontline support staff, all of these people who go to work every day and uh, they are constantly being put in jeopardy. And we got to ask to making sure that everybody's following the protocols that none is exempt from COVID-19. And uh, anyone can be a carrier and anyone can get it. It is like the cold, it's contagious. It's like the flu, it's contagious. So let's be mindful, let's be prayerful. Um, the staff of the hospital walked out um, because again, you can imagine being on the front line and you have to bring this home. You don't know if you got it. You might be asymptomatic. You have your mother there um, and God help you. You take it home and you, your, your mother who's in a, a a in the, the the category of high risk catches it and you can you imagine bearing that burden that you gave your parents something that might kill them yo that's the next level thing that i can't deal with but on top of all of the other issues that COVID 19 presents to us one that is of great concern one of my good friends she and i were talking today she's saying you know you you ready you getting ready to send your baby back to that school i'm like i don't know i don't know homeschooling looks like an option right now and I don't even like that idea. It's, who wants to be home with children all day? I don't know, like this, that, you know, little house on the prairie life ain't me, okay? I am not a desperate housewife either. I don't know how people do these things. But now we are in this text phase, this tech phase. And I'm happy that we're there. And Zena, thank you for being here because I have the confession. Can I, be, can I confess? Okay, sure. I'm extremely happy that we are being forced to adjust. Mm. I believe that one of the greatest things that's gonna come out of this COVID-19 is that we now have to be 21st century people when it comes to education. Yes, definitely. Uh, I, I'm hoping it in a tech way. I don't know if it is in the curriculum way and I don't know if the curriculum will adjust to take our children out of this antiquated way of learning, this factory style learning, but us learning now in, in the, you know, mm -hmm. the IB, the interlight, what is it, international baccalaureate um, format? Mm -hmm. I don't Program. know if that's possible. But we're here now, Zena. And mm -hmm. something that you mentioned, education inequality, right? I, I have said mm -hmm. this many times. The fact that one has to pay for better education shows that those who do not already at a, at the, at a terrible disadvantage. And education mm -hmm. should not be something, quality education should not be something that I have to pay for. Because what about those who don't have it? Education can change the station of a family. One person with a degree, mm -hmm. one person graduating high school, if no one in the family is a graduated high school, being able to say that, mm -hmm. they are, that they've finished with a diploma can change the status of their family. But we know what more a degree can do. Right, and uh, yeah. um, I, you know, I've been one who came out of the government system, and I can, I always tell the story. I thought I was sharp because I was a valedictorian. Yeah, I thought I was the smartest, but didn't mm. know what the standard was when I went to to COB, and I realized that I was smart on a D level or something. Then that changed everything. <laughs> <laughs> I was the smartest where we were not the smartest group of people to graduate from RM. So. That totally burst my bubble, right? Right. <laughs> and, uh, and I, you know, I don't have any shame in my game, right? And mm -hmm. it made me work harder because I got to, to UB and I'm realizing, Jesus, 
I don't know any of these things. Yeah. Did I not sit the same exam? Like what? Mm -hmm. <laughs> but my point is, when you look at the tech inequality, mm -hmm. when you look at the education inequality, are you surprised that the tech inequality is so severe? That would be my question. Mm -hmm. Not really. I think. Um... And if you could bring your microphone forward for me, because you, you, oh, you keep, yeah, come out. To the okay, yeah. Um, sorry, I have my head set on. Um, I, I think, I think what needs to happen, and I think what the pandemic also caused in our country too is a lot of dialogue. So you would notice now that you know there are a lot of webinars, um, you know, on people putting forth their point of view on different things, um, economic things. Um, health wise, but I still think that there's a wider discussion to happen in regards to education. There must be collaboration between public and private entities. And let me just give you a little bit about mm -hmm. a little bit more detail than what I mean about that, right? Mm -hmm. In the States, you would find that a lot of schools, even public schools or, or charter schools, right? Um, schools could apply for grants from different tech companies or, or bigger organizations, right? To help them with funding certain things that, okay, the budget just doesn't allow for, right? So in a country so small as ours, right? Um, I think what baffles me is that internet, internet access, especially in our schools, is not super affordable yeah. For, yeah. All of, for all of the schools. Right. Man. And I feel that, that that is something that could be easily rectified. That is something that could be easily rectified because are, even are schools it, getting charged the, the, the corporate bundle rate. <laughs> OK, I'll just say. All right. So so uh, during this time, too, it would have been a perfect time for um, I'm not to step on anybody's toes, but just to give suggestions on how people can work together. Right. This would have mm -hmm. been a perfect time for BTC or um, kids, what we call it alive, alive mm -hmm. now, right? To mm -hmm. offer to offer incentive packages. I'm just talking about. I, I'm going to talk about teachers in general. To those persons, those customers who are teachers, right? For me mm -hmm. to fully come over to your net. So if I was the BTC customer, okay. Um, during the pandemic time, I'm going to take off. If you're an educator, I'm going to take off thirty percent off your internet bill. Yeah, that's 40 good. 40% off your internet bill, right? Because mm -hmm. these, these, these big corporations, they contribute to other things, other charitable things. But like when we talk about education in this country, uh, we don't get big any organizations support. are going to have to be able to step up to the plate. And that's something that government is going to have to partner with. Because like in our public schools, we have excellent teachers. Some of my friends are excellent teachers, right? But the resources are, the resources are lacking. The yes. infrastructure, infrastructure is a big thing, even for private schools as well. So infrastructure, when um, we're talking about bringing devices to school or children having devices, you know how much money, if I have over 2,000 children going to a school, right? Mm -hmm. And you want all the children to bring their laptops to school, right? Or even bring their phones. You want them to be watching YouTube videos. You know how much bandwidth That's right. that is going to require. You That's know how right. expensive that is. So for schools, um, the organization, the companies that provide internet services uh, to our country. This is one way in which, like, some agreement needs to be made. Um, even if they partner with other organizations, okay, we're adopting this set of schools, whatever, yes. and yeah. we're working on the infrastructure. Okay, we're going to provide the infrastructure, so access to the internet is there. So even if you have it where the kids can bring their own devices to school, that's one hurdle that you don't have to deal with. So that's a, a big a big thing, right? Schools mm -hmm. can really apply, okay, um, I wanna get 3D printers in my school, right? And 3D printers been out from long now time listen. ago. And only a couple schools in this country have, have them. Have them, have them, right? So people, when we talk about- people in this country have never even seen them, never seen it. Don't know what the buttons look like, don't, don't know what software is needed to print 3D. So, oh, for God's sake, go ahead. Please go yeah. continue. So, so this is a big, I feel like this is a big market too 
that um, our internet service providers also need to tap into because they could also be leading the way on cutting edge technology and certain things that could be embedded inside the, inside the school. I don't know if it's because, okay, we don't really see a profit, we make yeah. a, you know, a profit from it, but there are certain ways in which we're gonna have to be able to partner with um, bigger organizations and even those and even educators or people who have a passion for education, they may not be in education, to come together, to put together a plan, because they are good about talking about ideas in the country. We're very good about talking about ideas and stuff like that. But when it gets to the nitty gritty, how to implement, how it's going to work. Sometimes too, that is what it, that is what is lacking. Hey, I'm beginning some challenges with your mic right there. It's starting to dip out a little bit. Okay. Uh, there you go. Good afternoon. Hey. Okay. Oh, yeah. All right. So, <laughs> so yeah. So being able to partner together, um, you know, pe different stakeholders from different, you know, sectors yeah. in the Commonwealth, there has to be a education think tank. And I think, you know, what you're bringing, Zena, such a great point there. And someone on uh, YouTube said the same thing, that it's a great idea getting mm -hmm. these bigger companies to partner with schools so as to help to bridge that divide. That Because if we have access to the just the base, because bandwidth or the internet is fundamental. It is the foundation of it all, right? Right. If we just had the base of it with more bandwidth, that would give us leave, even just a simple adjustment. We'll mm -hmm. give our tech teachers our our technology specialists, mm -hmm. more options on how we even teach yeah. uh, with the use of technology. Something else now, mm -hmm. folks who are looking at this virtual learning, how familiar are you with the virtual learning platform that the government has presented? Are you familiar with it? I know that um, just from what I heard, I don't wanna say too much. I know that they are looking at a, a, a platform. I know that they're looking at a, a, a different a universal platform. Yeah, a universal platform. But to say how uh, it is going to be implemented, um, because That's we have so question. many public schools, um, yeah. so many teachers, and you know, this is already August. Yeah. yeah. But the good thing that the ministry did put forth is that they would be starting virtually. Yeah. So I think that was a good call on 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 their end, you know. So I, I think to wait to see what's going to happen. Um, yeah, I think we'll have to wait to see what is going to happen. But that doesn't mean a school shouldn't be prepared, though. I, I feel it, it is no excuse as to why we can't be prepared for the virtual learning aspect of it, because that's something like separate and apart from the coronavirus. Yeah. So separate and apart from it, we should always be prepared anyway. So let me ask you this then. Mm -hmm. With, if a school, say for, say for example, right? I got my kids got a, a, a wonderful school that they attend. The school mm -hmm. has given up wonderful uh, protocols for this new school year. We're doing the blended learning, something that the government was all is was also doing. Right. I don't think private schools are going to switch to fully virtual. That's too much change. You lose. You know. I don't. I, I can't. I don't foresee any private school just going old scale. We going virtual. Mm -hmm. They're gonna try this blended mm -hmm. thing until the first breakout happens. That's just my thinking. Um, and knock mm -hmm. on wood, hopefully it doesn't happen. Mm -hmm. However, with this um, this uh, virtual space, right? Mm -hmm. I'm concerned just on the server side, even with the blended option. Do you believe that most schools have sufficient um, service power storage? Are you thinking that, uh, for example, the school that you teach at, are you guys putting everything in the cloud? Um, what sort of expense will that be? Because I'm thinking mm -hmm. a lot of schools, even the smaller ones who might not be as big, uh, mm -hmm. what, what expenses should they be in, you know, not expensive, but what, what technological parts of it should they be expecting, the, 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 the logistical part? Mm -hmm. um, I think you have to, every school has to look at their learning needs, right? Every, right. every school has to look at their learning needs. But you would find now the main thrust of any organization is a learning management system, right? And this would be a, how could I put it in layman's terms? This would be like a comprehensive online system where a student is able to log in, students, teachers, administrators. But on the student's part, 
the student is able to log in, right? And the yeah. student has a framework or a platform for knowing what is coming up. So communicating with his or her teacher or class, his or her classmates. So communication is a part of the platform. Um, knowing what assignments are coming up. My assignments are posted in one general location. I can upload my work in one particular location. I can view my grade in one particular um, location, right? And mm -hmm. for administrators, I'm able to also get data from my learning management system. I can see how many kids signed in on a particular day. I can uh, keep abreast of what my um, teachers are doing um, to make sure that, hey, are they posting assignments? Like, are they supposed to be posting? Are they interacting? Are they following the digital expectations we may have um, laid out? So especially when we look at from primary years up to high school, like yeah. you cannot go into uh, this new normal without having a centralized learning management system. And I think this was a frustration for a That's lot of parents because um, if a school didn't have a, um, how can I put it? a signature or a standardized learning management system, right? Mm -hmm. That all the students were on, even if it's for a particular section, right? So you gave teachers the flexibility of doing whatever they wanted to do, it lent to frustration, right? So even for me as a parent, right? My child mm -hmm. having all these, they're, okay, they got to, and you know, sometimes- it's very and, stressful. And, okay, kids at home, yeah, okay, they have to go to school, but you know, he's just doing the minimum to get by. You just doing the minimum to get back. So you still have to be behind them as a parent. So, okay, mm -hmm. now I got to go check your email. I got to check my email. I have to check yeah. your email. Yeah. Okay. I got to go on whatever, how many millions of platforms, whatever the teachers have. And like, for me, for me being technology, I would consider myself technology literate, right? It became mm -hmm. frustrating. So schools have to really um, explore sensible online learning options out there because guess what we are always going to have some type of pandemic or some type of crisis here in, here in the country okay almost every year we got to close the schools got to close down for yeah. a certain period of time for hurricanes okay that's so a great point great point if, if you have a if you have an online learning management system okay um you are able to still keep in contact with students in the event of power outages or whatever that they know to go it, the thing about it is children thrive off of consistency. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Children even need structure in the online environment. So a child needs to be able to know, okay, I could go on this platform and I know all my work will be posted there. Like even for me, like the students were able to message me um, um, through the Google platform. They were able to instant message me. I didn't have to give out my number because they asked yeah. for that. Yeah. All right, so they, mm -hmm. we could have a group chat. If they wanted to call me, they could call me. I didn't give up my phone number yet. They want to video call me, and some of them did. And I used to be like, okay, you know, this past school hours, you know, I'll have to deal with it. But, but you know, it made me feel good as a teacher that, hey, even at that young age, the children were taking command of their learning, you know? Yeah. And yeah. it wasn't so much, okay, my mommy or daddy sending an email on my behalf. No, I am asking for clarity on X, Y, and Z. And it gives students a platform to ask things in real time. And they're able to collaborate with each other and clarify because sometimes you may post things as a teacher and you think it's clear and it may not be clear. And a child asks a question underneath your post and other kids come back and clarify for the child. So... You know, that, that's yeah. an example of yeah. collaboration. They're working together. So we have to be able to now create this environment where we're moving from independent learning and more so collaborative learning. And mm. the online environment allows for that. And our children have to learn how to work collaboratively because when they're going in the working world now, um, you know, particular skills are being asked for. You need to know how to speak. Yeah, you I, need I to think know how to you know, function in the online environment. And, you know, so many things, because when you started off the segment, you, you presented such an interesting point in that we don't, there are even rules or decorum rules of, or, you know, just decorum rules mm -hmm. on mm -hmm. the online or in this, this technological space, right? Yes. And we don't talk in those terms. We don't speak in 
the terms of how to live in that digital space. I look at somewhere like Estonia mm -hmm. and how they have just transformed their digital footprint from having none in the 90s to now being one of the leaders in the world of individual, their, their digital footprint, their digital ID, their personhood, their digital citizenship. Mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. I, so therefore, when I, I say that to bring up a point that this point is, I'm looking forward to more conversations that lead to greater digital identity like this and that we, our children can be speaking in the language that you're right. talking in, and yes. that lingo, you know, because I, I think we're far from it, but boy, this opportunity is, is perfect. And I, I, I pray for my teachers who weren't asked to learn this way or teach this way before. Because no. I think it's a struggle, man. No, to be it is. I, and then go digital? Lord. <laughs> It is, and you know, and, and, and also two schools are gonna have a responsibility as well in terms of professional development for their teachers. Because if you're putting forth, okay, these are the tools that the students are gonna be using or that you want the teachers to use with the students, you know, there has to be some allowance for training, proper tra and ongoing training with it. And I think one of the things where we where the US does well with this is mm -hmm. that professional development in terms of technology training like is ongoing at different schools you have you have um non-traditional roles that like what we really don't have here and i think it's opening our eyes up to certain yes. things because when we think about the it department at a regular school you're just thinking about okay the tech support person the network the networking yeah. person yeah. right but now because of how um education and technology have had to kind of like marry each other there are other opportunities available now so you need people who are responsible for academic technology so being mm -hmm. able to act on behalf of the teacher like almost like be the liaison between the teacher yes. and the tech person or the teacher admin and the tech person you need instructional technology coaches yes who go into the classroom system and they help they help the teacher they they provide that support there these are and things that happen support. inside, you know, these are yeah. things that are happening around the world. And, you mm. know, it, it, mm -hmm. before we go, because I know we're running out of time, uh, tell folks a bit uh, quickly. You have like 30 seconds. I'm sorry to do this to you. Tell <laughs> folks a bit about this teacher's tech lab that you're doing on the okay. 17th of August. All right. So teacher tech labs is my baby. You can follow us on Facebook, on Twitter, on Instagram at teacher tech labs. Um, mm -hmm. So basically, this is an online course. I've been working with Google for years, um, but I felt the need to do this online course for teachers. So basic or teachers, anybody who's interested in educating, if you want to homeschool your child um, in this course is over three days, you will learn practical skills. So they have three live too? sessions. Yes, homeschooling people. OK, um, practical skills. We have three live sessions and then you get assignments to complete where I teach you how to use Google Classroom and organize it as a digital classroom. So you learn Excellent. communication skills, how to grade assignments, how to organize assignments, how to add students, how to integrate activities. So I think it's gonna be a worthwhile course. I've had a lot of um, persons who have already started to sign up um, for and it. Look, real so, quick, tell us how they can sign up because they gotta go, it's six o'clock. Okay. What's the number um, um, they can they can easily go to our Facebook page, Teacher Tech Labs, or Teacher Tech Labs on Instagram, and we have Excellent. different posts there with the information. Excellent. Okay. You're listening to the Hit Bag with Nahasha Black Zena. Thank you so much for the time, man. It was a pleasure no having you on. Everyone, Thank we you. will see you tomorrow. This is Dark Hill Radio, 96.9 FM, Nashville, Bahamas. <laughs> Thursday, August 6, 2020. Thank you for tuning in.